we had we had gotten small arms fire, so you knew what AK sounded like. Yeah. But that one clap, I, a sniper. That's it was like snipers have entered the chat. All right, what's up, Daniel? What's up, man? Thanks for being here, man. Ah, no problem. Thanks for having me, man. Yeah. Hey, let's just uh, continue with that story you were telling me about, man. That boot camp story. The... So boot camp, yeah, yeah, boot camp. It's the summer, a hot summer day in uh, Fort Benning, Georgia. I think the year was 2004, 2005 during boot camp. And uh, we're smack in the middle of uh, a basic training boot camp. And my drill sergeant, the main drill sergeant, drill sergeant Zillhofer, just like Brock Lesnar, big, wide dude, muscular, Scandinavian-looking guy. We go to the range, and I guess it was uh, infantry training. So we were doing uh, bounding, moving, moving down uh, the trail, bounding on leaps and bounding, shoot, move, communicate, all that good stuff. So we go to the range. He picks me out. He picks me and someone else. He says, Diaz, the other guy, come over here. You're going to help me be the safeties. So as the platoon and the, the squads, the platoon and the company starts rotating uh, trainees, uh, to move down the field, one thing they said was, make sure to keep your weapon as you run at the 12. So it was awkward running, you know, as you're running to maintain your rifle up straight ahead. And so sure enough, all day long, from morning to like afternoon, uh, everyone goes through. We were the safeties. We helped. We were, we were kind of up to par with the door sergeants. They had a sector. We had a sector. If we saw something wrong, uh, we let them know. It was a little brush fire. I called ceasefire. They put it out. So we're, we're, we're rolling. We're rolling. So since we were the last ones, since we were the safeties, we went at the end. So, you know, I'm, I'm some 18-year-old kid all cocky thinking, oh, I got this. I've, I've, I've got the whole, I, I went through the whole company. I was their safety. So I get my rifle, and then I start, right? And my partner goes. He bounds. He starts shooting live. This is live. He starts shooting downrange. Then I get up and start moving. So we do it for about two, three times. We're rolling. We're, 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 we're shooting. We're moving. We're, we're, we're in the rhythm. And smack in the middle of bounding, I, uh, I get cocky. I start running, and I do this huge leap. I, like, jump in the air trying to be funny. And I just felt like this semi-truck just fell on top of me, bro, and just slammed me on the ground face down. I think I ate my, my rifle, just busted on my face. And all of a sudden, I just feel someone picking me up and slamming me on the ground. Doo, 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 doo. I can't tell what happened. It's my drill sergeant, drill sergeant Ziegelhofer. He turns me around, slams me again face to face. Doo, doo, doo. And he starts spitting. He's so angry, he starts spitting at me saying, If you ever... Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> to this day, I don't know what he said. I don't know what the words he said. So I say, okay, I'll never do that again, drill sergeant. Roger Dorsant, he slams me. I'm all hurt. I get up. I walk back. The other Dorsant comes up to me. He's like, hey, man, you flagged Dorsant Ziegelhofer while you were running. You did not maintain your weapon at, the, at 12 o'clock. <laughs> so, yeah, I got, I got tackled by my drill sergeant and, uh, for flagging him, apparently. But yeah. that, was, that was my boot camp story. <laughs> man, all right. Um, Tell everybody what, uh, what branch you served in, uh, what years, and the job you did. Nice. I served, uh, I served uh, one contract, one four-year contract, the U.S. Army. I joined 2000, shortly after high school, 2005, and I, uh, I served as an 11 Bravo infantryman. Right on, right on, man. Um, what, uh, talk to me a little bit about your upbringing, man. Where are you from? Where did you grow up? And what was your childhood like? All right. I, I had a pretty normal childhood. I had both of my parents. I grew up with uh, first-generation immigrants. My parents from Mexico, uh, so I learned hard work. You know, my dad was always, you know, finding something to do. Uh, I was helping him do side jobs in construction. Uh, I grew up in uh, in uh, San Diego, the southeastern mm. part of San Diego, in this area called Paradise Hills, uh, specifically Skyline Hills. It was a uh, it was a uh, it was an inner city. It was a neighborhood, and. Um, it was a pretty diverse neighborhood. We had uh, a little bit of everything. We had black, Mexican, uh, Pacific Islanders, Simones, uh, and uh, Filipinos. We had a lot of Filipinos because San Diego was a huge Navy town, and there was a lot of naval housing there. So mm. that's where I grew up. Mm. What, uh, what part of Mexico are your parents from? My dad is originally from Mexico City. Mm. 
And then he moved to another city about an hour away in the state of Morelos where he met my mom. Then they moved over here. Mm, okay, okay. Um, what inspired you to, to go into the Army? Ooh, well, I think I was pretty young in high school. I might have been a freshman or a sophomore, I don't remember, when I saw uh, the Twin Tower attack, the September 11th. And so once I saw that, uh, I knew uh, something. I knew that was wrong, and I knew uh, justice needed to be uh, uh, served. You know, I knew the United States had to retaliate. And uh, although I was young, I knew it was it was wrong, and I knew it was unfair. And I always wanted to join the military. Growing up, watching the Rambo movies, watching Black Hawk Down, mm. uh, you know, that always inspired me to serve this country. So. Once I graduated, shortly after, I uh, realized, I think I'm going to do this. So I joined. I walked into a recruiter station, and the Army said, um, yeah, we'll give you 11 Bravo Infantry on your contract. And on top of that, they gave me $10,000. So mm. that, that was a, a young kid from the hood. You give him money. That was it. I bet. <laughs> yeah. Man, how did it, uh, you know, you being in high school during, um, you know, the September 11th attack, um, do you remember what you felt like, like seeing that on TV? Like, what emotions were going through? Did you feel angry? Did you, you know, what did you feel like? I felt like it was a cheap shot to the country. You know, mm -hmm. it was obviously unexpected. I understood that it was an uh, orchestrated um, attack on our country, and what kind of got me angry was that it was against defenseless civilians. Mm -hmm. That's what I remember. Mm -hmm. um, that kind of got me angry. Uh, I knew something needed to be done. Um, I was still like 15. I don't know how old I was. I was like a sophomore. And uh, and then seeing the timeline from 2001, September 11th, to I believe it was 2003, 2004, when uh, the U.S. invaded Iraq. Mm. Uh, I knew there was uh, some sort of motion going on, and I wanted to get in on it. I figured this is my window of opportunity uh, to serve, not to be just some, some, some kid from the inner city. Uh, I wanted to serve, and uh, I wanted to do something. I wanted to be part of something bigger. Right, and, right. Uh, and it was, it was right. It felt right. I didn't feel like, it felt right. Yeah. So when when you went in, when you signed up, were you hoping to go to war to find yourself in combat? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh, for sure. I yeah. knew from day one. I knew I was. I, I knew I'm joining the military during a. a a time of war. Mm. I knew I was going to deploy. There was no question in my mind. And sure enough, when, as soon as I joined the recruiter, said, you know you're going to deploy, right? Mm. I was like, yes, sir. As soon as we got to basic training, our first sergeant in boot camp was like, you guys, all you guys are going to be in a sandstorm in a year or two. And I was like, yeah, I understood it. As soon as I got to my duty station, mm. uh, my unit had just returned from a deployment, and I met up with them. And they told us, we just came back, and we're going to go again in a year. You're going to go with us. Yeah. And I, it, was, it was an understanding that I knew. So um, how long after you had signed up um, did you find yourself in a combat environment? I believe it was June that I enlisted. I walked into the recruit station on a Wednesday. I flew out to boot camp the following Thursday. It took a week. I go to boot camp, basic training, Fort Benning, Georgia, from June to October. I report to my duty station in October. And then a year later, and from October, almost to the week, we, uh, we get on a plane and we leave Fort Hood, Texas mm. to uh, Kuwait. Mm. And uh, talk to me about that, that tour, man. What was it like for you going over there? Oh, man, it was, like I said, we were all in the same mentality. We were all anticipating this. We all wanted to go there. And that whole year, reporting to my duty station in Fort Hood from October to October, we were just given all this training, fresh training from when they just came back from, uh, from their deployment. So we were anxious. We were, uh, we were very excited. We just couldn't wait to get there. We couldn't wait to step foot and start patrolling. And uh, that was a feeling, man, that we were just ready, ready to go. Mm. And sure enough, as soon as we got there, you know, I'm sure, like, we weren't the only ones. As soon as we start landing from, from Kuwait, we start landing in Bayak, the Baghdad International Airport, 
uh, we started getting mortared. And that was our welcoming. So we're like, yeah, this this is it, man. <laughs> wow. So we knew the party was on. And then uh, from Biop, we uh, we get flown into our our, our outpost. And yeah. that, the party started. Within the, fir- we were, within the first week, we were out patrolling and uh, engaged in small arms. Small arms fire. It was just, it's what we wanted and it's what we got. So when you you said you're landing in Biop, what, what's Biop exactly? Biop is the airport, Baghdad International Airport. Right. So when we landed, when we first got the commercial air flight, flight into Kuwait, we hopped into a, a C-130, a military airplane, and mm. then we landed into the combat zone, Baghdad mm. International Airport. And there's, that's the green zone. There's uh, two big camps here, I believe. It's Camp Liberty and Camp, I forget the other name. Yeah. We so, weren't there much. We were right. going on. But, but uh, so when you're landing in that C-130, you started ca- taking a mortar fire already? You yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Man. As soon as we got there, they told us, hey, the, they know it's a new, they know it's a switch. They know it's a rotation. They know it's a new division coming in. They're, they're going to be uh, give it, shooting mortars at us. So, yeah. yeah, we landed and you could hear the. Just the explosion. It was like there. It's like them saying, "Welcome to Baghdad." Yes, it was. A, <laughs> huh. That was a real welcoming <laughs> to us. Yeah. Wow, man. So, uh, uh, what, ba- what what outpost did, were you at? You From Bayat, we went to a forward observing base, Rustamaya. Okay. We were there for a little bit, a few weeks, a few months. We started patrolling. It was a big base. Mm-hmm. It had a it had a hospital. It had water, electricity. It had like barracks made out of uh, you know cement, brick, all that. Mm. It, has, it, it was a, a base. Mm. We were there for a few months, and then um, something happened. I don't remember. I think it was, uh, they called it the surge during that time, 2006 into 2007. They called it the surge, and then they brought in more troops, and they moved us out to this sector called Sector 9 Nissan, which is uh, to Little Cop, uh, combat, uh, combat outpost. It was Cop Hope, mm. and it was a small little, small little area that we provided our own security. Um, we had we had water, electricity was iffy, uh, and uh, that was that was about I want to say within two miles of Sauter City. Mm. Okay. And so we were there patrolling all that area. Mm. Do you remember what it was like? Um, you know that your first time, uh, you know, getting contact. Yeah, it was actually, oh wow! I'm glad you brought that up. It was, uh, it was, it was. I'm grateful for that. It was, uh, it was. Um, we were out patrolling, and we had our squad. We had a platoon. We had two infantry squads, and then some random officer, like a captain or a major, came up to. I don't know. They 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 worked it out. He wasn't in our chain of command. And he said, I want to, I, I need you guys to provide me security because he wanted to go do like something mission, like hearts and minds. He wanted to go talk to the locals about voting and I don't remember. So we take him out in our vehicles, in our Humvees. We get off. He starts talking to the, to the locals. He starts knocking on doors. And then uh, we we're like in this awkward T intersection, like this street. And uh, somehow, one squad got the east, one squad got the west, and I ended up with my squad who had the east, I ended up on the other corner with the other squad. And then the squad in the west, one of their saw gunners, I was a machine gunner, I was a saw gunner, was with my squad. So we were both catty corner to each other in the wrong squads. Mm. So we're in a corner, just kind of moving around, looking around, making sure no one, we don't get hit, as this captain is... uh, talking to the locals, and then my my team leader, Greenfield, uh, he comes up to me and he says, hey, Diaz, switch with Ramirez. You guys are, that way we can keep squad integrity. And I had been there for like five, ten minutes already. And I was like, all right, cool. And I'm like, hey, Ram Ram, let's switch. And all right. So we both switch. And then I stay with my squad. He's with his squad. Same sectors. And then I want to say seconds, within seconds, bro. I hear this clap just <laughs> loud, and it echoes. It echoes through the whole uh, the neighborhood, the street. And I'm like, what was that clap? And then everyone starts looking around like, what? What was that? 
And then you just hear on the radio. I didn't have a radio. My teammate had a radio. And then Greenfield tells me, Ramirez got hit. Ramirez got hit by a sniper. And I was like, Ramirez? I look over. I look over to Ramirez, and he's like on the ground bleeding from his face or his head. And I'm like, Ramirez. So we went, we went past the, the initial shock of getting hit to medevac. Mm. So they rolled everyone in. Uh, we, we get in the vehicles. We forget about the captain and his mission. We're like, hey, you're done. We're gone. They take him to... Uh, they take him to the nearest, uh, the nearest uh, post with a hospital, and uh, sure enough, he got hit by a sniper. Uh, it turns out he got hit right on the shoulder. The bullet went in and out, mm. right in that fatty part. No bone, mm. no nothing. And wow. I, I thought he got hit in the head, bro. Wow. I thought he got hit in the head. And then it wasn't until we got to our base that my, my, my team leader Greenfield was like, you know, that's where you were standing, right? You know, he, you had, he had you in your scopes. And I was like, yo, I was, bro. I was in his scopes, dude. Right. I was a bigger target, everything. And as soon as he switched us, he just stayed with him. I couldn't believe that, bro. And then that's when I... We, we, had, we had gotten small arms fire, so you knew what AK sounded like. Yeah. But that one clap, I, a sniper. That's, it was like snipers have entered the chat. Mm, <laughs> so now man. we knew, okay, all right, snipers are, snipers are going to be a problem. Wow, man. Did it hit you right away, like knowing that, you know, fuck, I was just in his position right there? I didn't really realize it until we got back. Mm. And we got back to our, to, I think it was still Rustamaya. And that's when our Greenfield told me, our, my team leader, hey, that was you. Wow. You were in the scopes. He was going to take you out. And that's when, the, oh, man, it's on. Right. It's on. It's for real. Right. All the other firefights we'd been, like small contacts, yeah. it was like, it was cake. Because we had trained the whole year. We knew how to maneuver. We knew how to do everything. But that sniper was, uh, we weren't prepared for it. Made it feel personal, huh? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Because, yeah. you know, the snipers are, they're fucking aiming in on just individual fucking yeah. soldiers. You know they what I mean? pick one, however uh, they pick one, and yeah. then they just hunt them. Yeah. Man. That's fucking wild, dude. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I had a few of those, actually. I had some more encounters where... I was in the. I realized I was in the sniper's uh, scope. Another one? Oh, I had a few actually, bro. Uh, snipers were a huge problem, bro. We, uh, I think, later on in that deployment, we were walking around with a warrant officer. He was like special forces, and uh, he wanted to do the hearts and minds, and we were walking, and uh, he had kids. He wanted like the picture perfect. He had kids. They were clapping. The kids brought out like instruments and they were singing like, I'm assuming folk songs from there. Mm -hmm. And we were doing the personal detail, security detail for him. And he was loving it, bro. I guess he was on a mission and he wanted like to, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know who he was, but he was very similar to the other officer. And uh, we were patrolling, so we were ahead of him. And then we, instead of a, a, a T intersection, it was like a, a capital T. So it was one, one street. And then this alleyway. So as we're patrolling, we go past the alleyway. The guy, the number one man goes in front of me. And then my dumb behind, I don't know why, I took a knee right on the alleyway. I took a knee and I took a sip of my water. And I was like, I shouldn't be here. Yeah, I shouldn't be here. And then my, my number one guy, uh, he said, Diaz, what are you doing? Get up. I'm like, yeah, I know. You're right. You're right. I get up and I keep walking. So that guy comes over, that special forces warrant officer, he comes in with one of our lieutenants, literally like 10 steps behind me. And they hit the, the, they hit the intersection. And then our lieutenant, we call him LTP, Lieutenant Perry. Another gun, <laughs> clap. He gets hit. Oh. I was like, yo, that, I'm like, yo. That. Whoa. I'm like, that was me. I, I, I took a knee, I took the pose and everything. I just sit there and I was, I could, they're like, I was done. If I would have wow. stayed there, if I wouldn't have had that sixth sense, if my buddy wouldn't have told me to get up, if he wouldn't have like, hey, what are you doing? Yeah. You're in the you're in the funnel. You're in the uh, you're in the kill zone. I was like, yeah, you're right, you're right, you're right. Second steps. I was like, oh man. So yeah, the lieutenant got medevaced away. They air flight him out, and uh, yeah, uh, that SF guy. We never saw him again. We're like, yeah, bro, not this sector. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> wow, man. Not did, this did, sector. Did that lieutenant make it? He did. Okay. He got shot in the arm. I believe the arm somewhere up here, shoulder arm. So the guy was obviously always 
uh, aiming for the head. Yeah, yeah. Always aiming for the head. Snipers were were a big problem, bro. Man, so you just had that intuition, like almost like a voice saying, "Hey, get yeah. the fuck out of here." Yeah, you know? I was like, "This, I'm too vulnerable. I'm too vulnerable in this intersection right now." And as I was thinking it, my buddy like, "Whoo, yeah, dude." One That's of my wild, yo, my best friend, dude, my best friend, he he was um, he was KIA'd through a sniper. Mm. We were out patrolling. We were in Humvees. I was always the last man. I was always I always had the six. I was the last. I was the last, uh, the last Humvee, and I always had the six, and he was, uh, he was best friend Jimmy Coon, bro. He was from the Bay Area, and, uh, Walnut Creek, I believe, and, uh, he was like, he was like 6'9", 270 on muscle, bro. Yeah. He was just my best friend. As soon as he got, I got, I think I beat him to our unit by, like, maybe a few months, and as soon as we both found out we're from California, we were just, we were out doing our thing. Then when we deployed, we'd always we were both machine gunners. Mm. We were always on the turret uh, on the on the Humvees, so we were always like in in sync. We always vibe. He had one sector, I had another sector. We were just shutting it down, bro. And it was a uh, it was a uh, April fourth. That was a very April fourth, and uh, we went out on patrol, and uh, we had a uh, we took a detour. I believe one of the officers wanted to go check on a school. I believe the I believe the government, if I remember correctly, they were giving the school uh, money, and they went and go check up on the school. Hey, what's up with the money? What are you guys doing? Uh, so we get on the street, we space out. He was the number one, number one Humvee. Took twelve. We're all spaced out on the street. We have houses on this side. We have a school on this side, and then we have more houses, uh, condos, apartments, whatever you want to call them. At like the one o'clock and uh and i remember everywhere we went we stayed no more than 10 to 15 minutes because snipers were a thing and it was coon ramirez the guy that had gotten shot mm-hmm. early in the deployment another guy redden joe redden and myself so we're all well we're all kind of just keeping our head on the swivel not too high not too low uh dismounts get out of the humvee they go check up the squad leader, the lieutenant. And then after about 15 to 20 minutes, we had that internal clock. We're like, hey, man, you guys okay? You guys coming back? We got to go. Like, this is, we're vulnerable. We're sitting ducks now. Mm-hmm. Oh, hold on, hold on. They're talking. We're like, I don't know, man. I don't know, man. I don't know. I, now, now it was just like, we're just sitting here, bro. Anyone could have came up here now and just set up. Right. And uh, kids come up to me. Kids come up to me. They're like, hey, I'm, you know. America, America, you want, um, they wanted candy. From the MRAs, we always had candy. I'm like, yo, get out of here. Get out of here. No, 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 get out of here. They go to the next one. You want candy? No, get out of here. He threw bottles at, bottle of water on him. Get out of here. So they finally go to the first one. And as they're distracting the driver, I'm like, I don't know, man. We got to go. I'm like, hey, we got to go. And I'm on the radio like, guys, we got to go. Hey, uh, remember what happened last time? And, uh. Sure enough, that was it. Seconds. Mm. You just hear the clap again. And I was like, oh, man. I'm like, who who was it? Did they miss? And then you just hear on the radio, Kun got shot. Kun got shot. Come back. Kun got shot. And I'm like, oh, man, Kun. So I had the six. So we're facing this way. I had the six. And I turn around my turret. And then the two other drivers in front of me, the gunners, they're like, balcony the balcony and i look over and i see the balcony i'm like oh, that's the guy so i had a 240 bravo we all had 240 bravos mm-hmm. and i'm like this is it done this whole neighborhood so i just go out ta 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 it was that balcony the whole floor everything bro windows doors whatever was in that area we just demolished bro people started coming out I was like, hey, that, that's a sniper right there. We started. We just went on that whole Mahala, the neighborhood. Mm-hmm. We just laid into it. Mm. All of us. We're coming out. We're coming out. I'm like, well, I'm not going to stop. And I'm about, I don't know, I want to say 10 yards above you. So just go from underneath. Mm. So I cover, I cover them. Bah, 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 And uh, I just remember seeing tracers. Chop, 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 chop. 
They come in. Go see it, go see it, medivac, medivac. We go to base. Uh, we unload. We unload. Uh, they, uh, as they're unloading my friend Kun, they take him into the, the, the hospital, whatever you want to call it, the medic room. They wound him. They patch him up. They wound him up. Uh, the helicopter comes in, and I'm still on the turret, uh, doing security because we're in a small cop, mm. and we provide our own security. So the, the landing zone was outside. So we had to do a perimeter for the for the the bird to land. So they take my boy out and I see them on the stretcher. And as they're taking him out, I see that his head is bandaged up and I just see this big blot of red that he was still bleeding. And, and it was just right smack in the middle, bro. Like smack and I was like how, like, is there any sort of way that anyone can come back from a, from an injury like that? Mm -hmm. And uh, I see them, take them off. Within seconds, the bird's out. And then we come back in. The captain, our company commander, Jeff, he's like, hey, guys, come here. He's like, the good news is that he lived. He's alive. And they're going to fly him to Germany, like, tonight. Mm -hmm. So we're like, Okay. And then uh, just moments later, probably the next morning, they call us like he didn't make it on the flight. He didn't make it to Germany. Like mm. somewhere on the flight, he didn't make it. And he's, he is a KIA. Mm. And yeah. uh, so while we were there, I think they sent, we were second platoon. I remember third platoon told me that they sent third platoon out back to see what they can collect, whether it was a, the sniper, whether it was intel. And they came back, they're like, you guys tore that mahala up, bro. You guys tore everything up. I was like, yeah. Bro. I was like, yeah, they got to know, bro. Yeah. We tore that whole building, windows, everything. He was like, there was just people around, just left. Uh, so that was that was just the message that we want to give. Every time we got hit, we came back with, but we, we left like a circle of death around there. Mm. We just needed, we needed to let, let them know. Even if it wasn't you, you allowed it to happen in your neighborhood. You allowed it to happen in your mahala. Yeah. You let someone come in and do this. You knew so, what was going to happen. So we have to. We, yeah. it, it, we have to do this. Do you, think the, um, do you think those kids were playing a st strategic role I believe in so. distracting you guys? I believe so. To I hold believe you so. Up? They were told, I believe they were told, hey, go offer them something. Go offer them or go ask for something. Mm. So it was, he was the number one driver. He had the closest shot on him. Mm -hmm. I was the furthest, so I could have been a... Any one of us could have been, but he was the closest. Mm -hmm. So even if the kids didn't distract us, he was... Uh, we were there too long. Yeah, yeah. I'm just going to say, he, we were there too long, and and we needed to leave, and he was the closest target regardless. Did you guys, did you, did you, did you guys think you got the sniper? I, I strong to this day, I, in my, I, I believe I got him. Yeah. To this day, I believe I got him. No other contacts with a sniper after that um or no. that specific one maybe in the area we had a lot actually mm. whether they were and then we would go into houses sometimes we would do um when we would hit houses we would see people different kids they're usually kids yeah young kids and they had pictures with them with a rifle mm. and it was always different kids so i was like i don't know if it's one pacific sniper if it's like a group of kids if it's one sniper training kids, I don't know, but uh, we that was our that was our SOP kind of like uh, uh, Will was said. Every time we got hit on the road, it was just 360. Mm. Whenever we got a uh, that was my I remember that was at our our squad leader said Hosey. He was like listen he was he was like some guy from the south, southern accent. Every time we get hit, every time we get hit by a sniper, we're just gonna rush them, rush them, and just. Any balcony we see, any uh, tower we see, that's it. We're going to tear it apart. Mm. So that's what we did because Sniper was a huge, huge, from the beginning to the end, it was a huge threat. So every time we got a Sniper, as soon as we saw them, which way did they fall? They fell this way? All right, that way. Yeah. Um, how did that, uh, how, how long were you into your tour when this happened, when Jimmy got hit? It was towards the end. Mm. It, when, it was around, the, it was in the middle to the end, so we deployed in October, and it was April, October, November, December. 
June, February, March, April. Smack in the middle. Yeah. Smack in the middle. And uh, it was March and April where we had the most casualties. We had roadside bombs, uh, double IDs, snipers, uh, roadside bombs, EFPs. Yeah. It was everything. Um, how did it, uh, did it impact you or how did it impact you, you know, uh, losing one of your best friends like that and still having to remain in combat with the, uh, with the job to do, man? How did you get over that? It was definitely a vulnerable time. And the, when my, my best friend died, because we had already lost about five guys two weeks prior mm. due to a, a roadside IED. And uh, it was a vulnerable time. We had done, a, we had done an all-night raid and then, the, and then into the next day. So that morning, we split up. Some of us went to the, the, the fog. The other ones had a, trans, they had a transport someone, something, and they got hit by a double IED. The first ID they got hit, they went out to take pictures for intel, and then the the insurgents, Al Qaeda, the insurgents had caught on to that, so they had a double ID waiting mm. for the dismounts. So we had lost maybe five, five uh, from one event. I think wow. three or four died immediately. The other one, or maybe five or six, and then the other two died shortly after due to wounds sustained. So that was March, and my boy Kuhn, he was there that day. He brought, he helped too. He did, uh, he did our, uh, he dismounted once he saw the double ID, and he, uh, he administered life, life-saving uh, efforts right away, tourniquets, all that good stuff. So out of, the, out of that group, two of them survived, and then later on they passed away due to their, their wounds. One of them in Germany, I believe, and the other one on their way to Walter Reed. So we were still vulnerable from that, and we were all like in awe of Kuhn, because uh, we're like, I was like, bro, you know, you saved so much, you did so much, and he was, he was all like, he was affected from the, from the event, and then to like maybe three weeks later for him to die, and get, you know, to be KIA, it was, it was just like hit after hit after hit. And instead of shrinking back as a platoon, we're like, we're done with this place. We're done with this place. Like never again. Mm -hmm. We're gonna we're gonna make it clear. We're gonna make it clear. Don't mess with us. Give us whoever it is. We'll go get them. And then just that mm -hmm. was it. It was just uh, instead of shrinking back, we just pushed forward. Yeah, yeah. Whew, that's rough, man. I'm sorry to hear about um, Jimmy, man. Isn't uh. It's April 4th today, right? You, you did mention that, huh? Today is April 4th, so, yes. So, uh, from 2007, and today is the anniversary of uh, my good friend passing away, being killed in action. I think we could dedicate this interview to, to your friend, man, yes. your good friend, you know? Yes. Sorry to hear that. Um, so, um, well, even after having to, you know, uh, you know, witness all that trauma and losing friends and stuff, I mean, you still got a job to do, right? Yes. Uh, um, you know, uh, I'm curious, like what leadership is like after, uh, being hit like that, man, do you see people stepping up and, 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 you know, helping uh, other guys out that maybe may not be doing so good? Are you guys checking up on each other? What do you guys do during your downtime? Well, we were short. A lot of people, obviously we lost, we lost like five, six and then Coon seven probably. So we were at a vulnerable time. We were still patrolling, uh, we, we didn't like talk about it. We didn't talk about it. Uh, and I found I found someone I could talk to in private. Mm -hmm. Him and I, we were Kuhn's best friends, uh, Evans. And uh, we were, uh, we would just talk to each other. We remember the times we had with them. We always found one person that we could confide in. And um, we were still out there patrolling. I know our chain of command was like, we still have a job to do. Uh, keep your head on a swivel. And uh, we were able to get maybe like a, a replacement, quote unquote, squad for personnel from another infantry company over. Mm. Yeah, we were Bravo Company 1-8, first CAV. And uh, Alpha Company was infantry company as well. So we got some guys from them that came over to us. And it was at a vulnerable time. They came in, we're exactly what, they were exactly what we needed. Mm. They were, they gelled well with us. Uh, one of my new best friends now, my brother, uh, 
he's this big Islander, Tongan guy, Tatua. He's up in the Pacific Northwest and Northwest, and I talk to him whenever, whenever I get a chance. Mm. He was actually my, my. He stepped in, and we were roommates, and yeah, he nice. was. Uh, yeah. Um. What what uh did you ever do anything out there uh to 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 lift your spirits or like when you had downtime, um you know, you know I know that you know you know combat goes from fucking extreme boredom to a bunch of action. Yes. What kind of things did you guys do uh to kill your time to you know oh, maybe man. keep your mind busy? Well, we uh what did we do? Depending on where we were, like so if we were in the small cop, the combat operation post near Sauter City. It was like a basketball court, so mm. we played, we played basketball. We had like a little, very loose tournament among squads. Uh, we played Madden. <laughs> we mm. played a lot of Madden, uh, Halo, mm. uh, and then uh, when we were in the bigger, the bigger, the bigger base, Rustamaya, we would go to Rustamaya maybe like once a month mm. to get our vehicle serviced, and uh, you know, maintained and uh, whatever it is mechanics do. With the co- with the cars, with the Humvees, we would uh, we would kill time there. What would we do? We would just act a fool, man. I think one time, who was it? I don't know if it was me. I think it might have been me. I came back home. I came home to San Diego on leave, and I think I don't remember. I might have brought back with me some um, luchador masks. Mm. And I picked them up at the border. When you go to Mexico and come back, yeah. there's vendors. Right. So I think I might have picked up some masks. I took them with me. And then we just started acting a fool. We would just do like WWF, WWE, wrestling matches. <laughs> we, were, we didn't have a ring. It was just out and about. Someone would put the mask on and look for someone else. And then they would play along. And then we would do like, we would do the, you know, Stone Cold Stunner. We would do, my go-to move was a sharpshooter. I like Bret Hart, you know, I'm the best there is, the best there was, the best there ever will be. And that was my go-to move. I would, uh, we would play around and then I would go to the sharpshooter. Then someone else would do like uh, uh, the stunner. Uh, someone tried to do the choke slam. And mm. it was more to just let steam off, you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, the bigger base, Rustamaya had like organized like indoor soccer. Mm tournaments they had like this big ring with like the sumo wrestling suits Mm -hmm. but we couldn't get those we we couldn't go to them because we were outside so we were like hey you know what let's just we we would just act a fool just (laughs) put your door mask and then just that's funny yeah um when did you get out i got out uh we came back 2008 so late 2008 okay late 2008 i got out um Um, out processed I'd like to get in, like, what that transition was like, man. So, you know, after having experienced, uh, uh, you know, that that combat tour and uh, being hit like you did, losing one of your best friends and then all the other guys, what's it like transitioning out, man, and, and, and trying to become a civilian again after all that? Oh, man, it's tough because the military is uh, obviously the United States military has been around for over 200 years. So every it's a well-known machine. Everything is yes, no, this is right, this is wrong. When I came back out, it was so difficult, bro. Like getting like I had a job. I, I worked as a those armored truck companies. So if people were coming late, they were ah, oh, don't worry about it. I'm like, oh, don't worry about it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm over here 15 minutes early, and this guy shows up 30 minutes late, and yeah. you're like, don't worry about it, you know? Right. It was it was tough to like understand that. And the civilian world is, I don't want to say no structure, but very loose structure. There's a lot of gray area. Mm-hmm. You know, if someone messed up, it was like, it would be ignored. It wouldn't right. be addressed. And uh, it was tough, man. I, uh, I had, it was tough. The, the everyday, everyday life was tough. And then personally, I, I, I struggled as well. Yeah. I was having, I was having issues. I, I'm just going to be honest. I was having issues and I ignored them. I was, um. I was having dreams, messed up dreams, nightmares, uh, odd dreams that met that had like some sort of deep significance that I didn't know how to how to interpret. You know, mm-hmm. uh, inside I was I was going through the motions of life. I wasn't enjoying anything. I I had issues, bro. I had issues. Uh, I felt like 
my life had no 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 purpose, no cause, no sense, no no meaning. Mm. And I, it took me about five years to realize that. I was carrying with that five years, dude. Wow. And I was bottling it up, and I couldn't. I just couldn't anymore. I couldn't. So uh, uh, through my, the VA wasn't really helping. I would try to call the VA for help, and mm. if it was, let's just say, if it was January, I'm like, hey, I want to go in and talk to someone. They're like, oh, okay, we got, we got the second week of October open for you. If you, I was like, sure, I guess. Give me right. October. I'll, yeah. I'll. Uh, <laughs> Right. Uh, let's jump on that before you know yeah. it, it gets taken. So I saw at the time, 2008, the VA was overwhelmed. It mm-hmm. wasn't the best. So I uh, I went with my insurance, my private insurance. Mm. So I had a job. I had insurance. So I went through them and I made an appointment. And apparently the first appointment you made with like a counselor, it's like a, how would I call it? It's like a intake yeah like an intake like uh assess you there you go mm-hmm. like an assessment mm. they're like fill this out from one to ten from one to ten mm-hmm. one being the lowest ten being the most right and i was just like ah oh, i need to talk to someone they're like no your first appointment is assessment yeah our next appointment is in two weeks and i had gone into the appointment thinking i can finally just let it out mm-hmm. so i had it like i felt like i had a frog right here i was like i can finally let all this out and I was like, I need to talk to someone. I need to talk to someone. I can't leave here without talking to someone. Mm-hmm. And uh, and they they went to the back. Hey, this guy, he needs to talk to someone. So I did. I did my assessment, and they got a counselor or a therapist. And I remember she was like a young, either Russian or Eastern European young lady. She had that accent, you know. She's good English, but you can tell she had an accent. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, she was like, listen, this is, we never do this. We're not supposed to do this, but because you're here because of the military and you feel like you need to get some help, I, I'll go ahead and help you out this first. I'm not your counselor. I'm not your therapist. It's going to be someone else. Mm. I was like, I don't care. So, yeah, we walked into an office and I just laid it out. I'm like, oh, this is how I feel. I feel like I have, uh, I, just, I feel like I, I'm numb to everything. I can't I have no feeling. I don't enjoy I don't enjoy family parties. Uh, my kids, I see them, and I feel like something's gonna happen to them. I feel like I'm. I feel like karma's gonna come back. I feel like I did so much, so much wrong, uh, and I, I feel like I, you know, I, I feel like I did so much wrong, and I and I and I, I killed people that were unnecessary. I started second guessing myself. Mm. I, I don't know what to do, and then I talk, I started telling her about my dreams. I started telling her about how. I had dreams of the people that we lost and my interactions with them in those dreams. And and I remember talking to her and I lost kind of lost sense of myself and I started just spilling everything. And uh, I look up and, and she's just bawling her eyes out, bro. She's just broken. She's like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. I didn't know you guys go through this stuff. Oh. And now I'm like, yo, am I okay? Like, <laughs> am I, am I, <laughs> am I broken? Am I, You're am like, I irreparable? The, yeah. The therapist is crying. Oh man, I, I oh. couldn't believe that, dude. I was like, man, I made the therapist cry. And she's a professional, bro. You know. <laughs> and she's like, I'm so sorry you go through this. Uh, I, I didn't. I don't think she said I don't know what to do, but she had that sense of. Uh, yeah. Of this is an emergency, you know. Right. And she was like, and I felt good just letting it out. Mm. And she's like, we'll schedule you an appointment for your your assigned counselor in a week or two and talk to him. Yeah. And yeah, it felt good just to get that off my chest. Doesn't it, man? Just to oh. just to have somebody to talk to about it and yes. get if it, it almost feels like you like everything you're that's coming out your mouth is taking weight off of your. Oh shoulders. yes, bro. A hundred percent agree. Yeah, man. Um, I, well, you know, I'm really happy that they decided to see you right then and there, yeah. you know, because oftentimes the VA, you know, they like to go through the letter of the law. Well, no, this is how it's done. Yeah. You, you can't come back till this day. It's like, fuck, man, just be a fucking good human being. Yes. You, you see, like, this person's hurting right fucking now. Like, yeah. get somebody to help. Look at all these people around here. Get fucking someone to attend to him for 10 minutes or something. Yeah, you know what yeah, I mean? yeah. So I'm really happy to hear that they did that. Um, oh, man, it, awesome. it felt great. It, yeah. it does. You need to find someone. If, you, if you're struggling with that, find someone. Find another veteran. You yeah. know, and just share stories, bro. Yeah, man. It just, whew, 
So do you do you continue to, to go to the VA to uh, or how are you doing now with it? Like now, I imagine well, I, you got PTSD, right? Who the fuck goes through all that and yeah. doesn't have any kind of form of? Yeah, right. so I they diagnosed me with the typical PTSD, depression, anxiety, uh, traumatic incidents, all that stuff. Mm. They're like, yeah, you got the combo. This is just yeah. textbook. Mm. And uh, uh, I I think I went for like a year or a little bit over a year. I went like once a month. I would go talk to my my counselor, my therapist, and he was like, he shared that his father was a World War II veteran in in Germany, mm. and that's what helped. That's what kind of inspired him to help other mm. people. So he said, when when I came across the board, he said he picked me up, and he said, I, you 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 and your story is the reason why I became a, a therapist. So mm. I knew right away, and I think I went with him for like a year, and then also I started I started growing and networking and created like a, a support network for mm. me. Uh, I started reaching out to my buddies. Once I once I did that, I felt okay reaching out. I reached out to Ramirez, who's right here in Riverside. I would reach out to uh, another buddy in Dallas, uh, another buddy in uh, Boston. Mm-hmm. He was another squad leader, Olsen. Uh, my team leader, Greenfield, I mm-hmm. talked to him. Uh, it was very selective people that I felt comfortable opening, opening up to and touching bases with. Nice. Even if it's just like, hey, guess what? I got this, I got that going on in my life, this yeah. and that. And then they saying, oh, yeah, we got this and that. I think one of them, Olsen, he's like a sergeant major. Mm. Yeah. So wow. he, he's he's good. I mean, when he talks to me, I feel like I'm talking to him back in. Like <laughs> just some kid, huh? Yeah, hey, bro. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Me too, man. I got buddies that are out. They retired majors and all this. I'm like. You're a fucking boo. Yeah. <laughs> You're a fucking boo, bro. You ain't I no man. I don't care what's on your ring. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Man. man. Oh, that's great, man. I think they need it, too. Yeah, they yeah. They need to talk to people like just regular guys. Yeah. So would you say it sounds like that's something that you did to, you know, you created a support system around you, and that's maybe something that really helps you deal with all that. Oh, right yeah. Now. And it does. Actually, a lot. Uh, I save certain things, and I reserve certain things out and uh for them, mm. but then like locally, like where I live in San Diego, I'm, I, I live back home in San Diego. I uh, I found uh, I found a church. I found a nice. church. Uh, I currently work law enforcement, so uh, sometimes it's hard on Sundays. You know how mm. it is. And but I hit them up. Uh, they counsel me. They they give me a word of encouragement. Uh, they give me you know spiritual you know pastoral care. Mm. Uh, and uh, so much so that I think a year ago, two years ago. A year ago, yeah. A year ago, around this time, they put out an announcement at, in my law enforcement agency to become a chaplain. Oh, wow. Organizational chaplain within our agency. So mm-hmm. I put in. Nice. And then there was, it was a vetting process, brother. It yeah. was a vet. They didn't, it wasn't like one of those things where they just give it to whoever now, so based on seniority. Right. It was a vetting process. And uh, it was an interview process. Uh, re- references from... Uh, uh, a place of worship mm-hmm. and I went to my church and I'm like, hey, help me out. You know, I want to, I want to help others even if I can't within the sanctuary, within the church, I want to help others in the agency. So yeah, I got selected and uh, I've been a chaplain for close to a year now. Wow, man. And, yeah. And Congrats. I, I, thanks, man. And uh, yeah, it's great, man. Reaching out to other officers, new officers, officers that go through traumatic events. Right. You know, they come up to me, uh, and and they just they open up and I'm able to you know put my training training in uh in an action yeah and uh, there's a lot experience. of resources for law enforcement and I fill them in on that that's awesome man it is man it's that feeling of I was there once mm-hmm. it's not about me but it's I was there once and just so you know you can be there right. too you know yeah you can get out of that rut hell and, yeah uh, dude that's what it's about just helping helping others yeah yeah that's awesome man well we're getting ready to wrap it up. Um, uh, I like to give everyone an opportunity before I cut the tape, man. Any last words or anything that you wanted to get in that maybe you, ha- you didn't get in? Um, or, you know, it could be just uh, encouraging uh, encouraging words for maybe vets getting out you yeah. know, now, you know? Oh, totally. Um, you know, veterans, we, we only understand each other. Whether you were any branch of the military, whether you had um, a certain job, specialty or not. We, we we have a we have a culture. Find find your buddy, 
even if they're not your buddy from when you deployed, find a buddy within your area. Get involved with uh, uh, veteran uh, uh, community events. Uh, it, it's, it's difficult. It was difficult for me. And yes, it's difficult. I'm not going to lie. It's not like I picked up like, yeah, let me call this guy. No, no, no. It's going to be difficult. You're going to have to put your pride aside. You're going to have to put your, 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 your stand, every stuff aside that prevents you. Mm. But I'm telling you, as soon as you seek help, or not even help, as soon as you connect. Because when, when we think we're seeking help, it's like we're, we're like stranded on the, on the side of the road. Right. No. As soon as you connect with someone, bro, it's, it's just, it's its own culture, man. There's, I, I can tell you this. There's literally nothing, nothing you can say or do that, that'll make a, another veteran go like, dang, you know, amongst us, each other would be like, yeah, either I was there or my buddy, my buddy was there and it's mm. going to be okay. We right. can move past this. Right. Awesome, man. Hey, well, uh, hey, thank you for your service, Daniel. And, oh, uh, you know, thank you for coming here and taking a seat, man. It's a big contribution and we appreciate it. Ah, thank you for the opportunity. Appreciate it. Thanks. Push it to the limit, I can't go no more. Red light, no way I'm coming back home.